beautiful song. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, it gives me a lot of confidence about what I'm going to say uh, this morning. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge and thank Babu for all that he has explained to us in the last session. Uh, amazing view of uh, all the different views that uh, uh, the world has in interpreting the Word of God in, 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 in um, the issue of uh, the last days and uh, His coming and and uh, what's going to happen and, and, and so on. And uh, um, as we know, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, the Christian people, the Christian uh, churches and Christian scholars, in fact, uh, do not have a consensus about uh, exactly what's going to happen. Um, so we have different views, and uh, Bobo beautifully, beautifully presented, and I was so uh, amazed at uh, some of the things that he explained to us very, very clearly. Uh, um, Premillennialism and uh, uh, post-millennialism, and uh, you have a millennialism, uh, and. Uh, and in premillennialism, you have historic one and you have dispensational one. Uh, all the different things. Um, the little differences that we have in interpreting the word of God and understanding and then saying, oh, this may not happen this way. This may not happen this way. This may not happen that way. Uh, the kind of uh, differences that we have. Um, the first time that I uh, had to wrestle with myself with some of these things, uh, was when I had to decide which denomination that I belong to. <laughs> Am I a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or Baptist or Hebron or Brethren? Who am I actually? I mean, where do I put myself, slot myself in? And I had the biggest struggle there. And um, um, as I was growing up and I was growing up in the Brethren tradition, uh, my my dad is a very very strong uh, brethren. We come from the brethren tradition, and we were grown up in that. And then um, I strongly believed. And nobody told me as such, but the way that uh, we grew up within that tradition, uh, I thought no one else go to heaven. <laughs> uh, no other denomination will go to heaven. And then um, uh, in the next lane. Uh, after some time, I mean, as I was growing up, uh, next lane, uh, a, a, an evangelist from Hebron Church came and then had a public meeting with the mic on. Uh, you know, the loudspeakers that they have in uh, India uh, when they're having a meeting. Uh, the next, next street, uh, street next to us, and he was having a meeting there, and then I was really angry, and these people have come up to our area, uh, and... Uh, and uh, they sang songs and they preached and, uh, and so on. And at the end of the meeting, as they were closing, and uh, that uncle, I mean, the evangelist, uh, as he was closing in prayer, and he prayed for my dad. Uh, he prayed, uh, Lord, uh, please bless uh, Uncle Anandrao here. And uh, he is your 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 servant and the marvelous work that he is doing and bless his work. And he prayed for us and for the whole family. Uh, and then he finished. And that disturbed me. And I went to my dad and then said, uh, Dad, they prayed for us. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they first of all, they came, invaded into these people and those who don't go to heaven uh, other than brother and tradition. And these people came and then they, they first of all, had a meeting in our own area, and then finally, and that disturbed me actually a little bit in my heart, and they prayed. And then my dad uh, put me, some and sat me there, and then he explained to me, all of us would go to heaven. Uh, the only issue is whether you have accepted the Lord or not, but, and that disturbed me quite a lot. So why do we have these differences? And how am I a brethren uh, superior to everyone else? Uh, so if everyone else goes to heaven, I mean, what is so special about me? And uh, that, that triggered a lot of thinking, and I kept quiet. Um, uh, this is all different thoughts that invaded me. And then as I was growing up, I thought this is all nonsense. 
uh, it's unnecessary pressure that I'm going to go through while my friends are playing, you know, uh, on Sunday morning and um, the best games in the world are played on Sunday morning and wow, what am I doing here? Uh, and the kind of stuff. And I told you my story and how I was praying, Lord, Lord, take me away from this home and this is too much for me and, and the rest of it. Uh, but as I was approaching the word of God and I find that there is, there is truth in all these different denominations. As I was in uh, my, um, uh, my uh, post-graduation, I think, and we used to go to the nearest church there and, that, and very briefly we used to go there and sit there. Um, and then that is Layman's Evangelical Fellowship. Uh, so we used to go there and they never used to accept us and they used to look at us as sinners, you know, uh, university fellows coming and then uh, not having any kind of commitment and so on. They always used to look at us outsiders and so on. Um, they never accepted us as part of them and then dealt with, uh, with us kindly or anything like that. I mean, for that particular um, uh, group of people, it's a, it's a large group of people, over 200, 200 people there at that time. Um, but anyway, as, as, I, as I look at each of these denominations and uh, at different points in time, and I had to personally deal with these different denominations as to how they uh, affect me personally uh, and as, as in my own life, invaded into my own life. And as we were growing up, uh, when uh, we had to marry one of our sisters, um, a match from uh, Pentecostal people came. And my dad rejected us, saying that no Pentecostal people were not going to be married. <laughs> and that match went, we never even considered because we thought it's not okay. Um, so each of those things came very close to me and then we had to take a decision about these things and so on. But as I grew up and then started to look at the word of God with fresh eyes, with fresh uh, interest, and wanting to know and asking the Lord to explain to me uh, what it is. And, uh, uh, and there is a bit of truth in every uh, denomination. And, uh, and uh, they unfortunately highlight a few things uh, of what they believe and make a big uh, denomination. And then uh, they slot themselves into that denomination, don't accept any others and so on, which is unfortunate, but uh, that's what it is. Um, so if you ask me what denomination now you belong, <laughs> uh, so I have to tell you that I'm a Brethren Baptist uh, Hebron Pentecostal and all the rest of it, and, and, and my title is too long. <laughs> um, so you have to get out of these different things and then approach the Word of God freshly and then see what, what the Lord is telling us, what the Bible is telling us. There are definitely sometimes... Um, there are difficult passages and there are things that may not fit in very well. And that is the time that you need to take a step back and then ask the Lord to explain it to you. Um, when I was growing up, uh, we know this particular uncle. I mean, I, I know so many people of great faith, great faith. They come from poor background, poor background. All that they produce is one bag of rice uh, for the whole of the year, the kind of stuff. Um, and uh, very difficult lives, but the faith that I have seen, now I am looking back and then understanding those people. When I look at their faith and now it is beyond me, beyond me, beyond my understanding how they are able to live the kind of life. Uh, I can tell you so many stories about that because I grew up uh, and then I have a critical eye all the time and I am an observant person. Uh, so I try and observe and things and then learn and stuff. Automatically, um, no, I do those things. Uh, this one particular uncle, I mean, he uh, is not far from Bapatla, where we are from, and Bapatla itself is a very small township. And this, this comes from a village. And to, co to go to that village, you have to wait for a bus. Uh, my mom comes from, uh, from that village. It's called Santarau. <laughs> uh, and uh, we used to travel there, and I used to wait for two hours for that bus, and then that bus comes, and then they used to load us into that bus, and I, there were times that I traveled on top of the bus. They used to load us even on top of the bus, and I used to enjoy riding on top of the bus, and it used to go like this, like this, and so on, and it's a village, a small village, and from that village came an uncle. Um, uh, 
didn't didn't go to school at all and uh, he waits for the school to finish uh, in front of his house on a on a on a rugged uh, cot uh, he waits at the school children go home he used to get hold of them i'll give you 10 paisa can you read this word for me and he used to wait for uh, children to come back from school and he waits with his open bible and uh, they, they the children come and then start to read for him that is how he developed and then finally he developed reading a little bit and he started to read himself but uh, writing he used to employ these little children and then uh, he used to tell them what to write and one of the books that he produced several books in the whole process in his lifetime uh, one of the books he produced is uh, produced was um, uh, um, uh, Christ hidden in the Old Testament. Telugu uh, the bond maker. In Telugu it is. Pathan vannolo gupta moyinna Christ Prabhu. That is the title of the book. And uh, Christ concealed in uh, the Old Testament. And he produced that book um, without any knowledge of anything else. I mean, I I doubt whether he read any other book of theology or anything like that. Uh, he, all that he read was his Bible and that also he depended on school children to come home and he used to grab them and then ask them to read and so on. They used to read for him. Uh, from there he understood and then he produced this beautiful literature. And then when I moved to the West, uh, not West in, initially, I, I went to, um, I was in the Middle East and uh, we used to have uh, nights and nights and discussions of all these different things. But when I finally understood what these scholars from the West produced after going to uh, world-class seminaries, what they produced and what they told us in these beautiful books, which I, which I bought and which I borrowed and which I read and gone through and, and the people that I sat with and, and the nights and nights and nights and discussions and stuff like that. That guy in that little village, that uncle in that little village, said the same thing, 100% the same thing. After all this knowledge and everything that is coming from seminaries that uncle told us from that little village a long time ago and in much more beautiful way with the beautiful support of the word of God. All that he got was the word of God, one book, the book of Bible in his hand, only one copy. He didn't have even different versions. You and I have NIV and NLT and NKJV and KJV and AKJV authorized King James Version and, and whatnot, and you have so many versions and so on. But he didn't have any of those things. He had one small Bible uh, that is also torn. And uh, to buy that Bible, it used to be about five rupees at that time. And five rupees was a big struggle for them to buy a Bible at that time. Uh, I, I, I grew up in that environment and so on. But what I want to tell you from all these stories is this. What you need to understand the word of God is the help of the Holy Spirit of God. He is the teacher. He is the teacher. And without his help, it is possible that we mess up. We misunderstand. We cannot really interpret uh, the word of God properly. And we need his help. We need his help. And these people that I talk about, and I can tell you so many stories, all my, all my brought up, uh, how much they depended on prayer and how much they actually looked at the pure word of God and they understood and so on. And uh, it's amazing. Um, anyway, I, I can tell you lots of stories like that, but um, just want to uh, look at a few things and then uh, I would like to uh, close. Uh, Glory, can I share the screen? I, I think I do. I can. Uh, just want to share the screen. Uh, can you can you see the screen? Yeah, you do. Very good. <clears throat> um, yeah, we, we, we looked at this slide before God's calendar. Uh, God's prophetic calendar, um, and we looked at quite a few things. I just want to recap a few things and then go a little further and then show you some 
uh, passages from the scripture and then close. That's, that's my plan for today. Uh, here, uh, there's a verse, if you want to, Isaiah 46, and this is verse uh, 10. And I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I make known, and uh, the Lord wants us to know um, these things. I make known the end from the beginning, from everlasting to everlasting. The end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come, what is going to come. Uh, what we call eschatology. And uh, finally, this is what it is, and his purposes will stand, and he will do what he pleases. It is God's plan, and it's God's idea, and it's God's agenda, and he will do it what he wants. And that will happen. That will happen. That's the idea. But he wants us to be part of that plan. He wants us to be aware of what he wants to do. It's not your program, it's the Lord's program. Uh, that we are following. That's the first point that I would like to make. And uh, we know, uh, you know that we looked at this diagram before and it is, uh, we looked at uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 23 and we looked at all the different feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, the feast of first fruits and feast of Pentecost or the feast of weeks uh, in other um, renditions and feast of trumpets and atonement and tabernacles and so on and I've given you the time frame um, between these things and all these different um, um, happen in the springtime and uh, these feasts happen in the time of our season of autumn fall we call it um, and they are from the Lord these are of the Lord and it is God's mandate uh, we looked at as we as we open and then read uh, Leviticus chapter 23. Um, this is for the people of Israel and he prescribed these feasts specifically to do them and observe them and, and Jesus Christ himself observed them as we uh, read the gospels and so on. And I have shown you all those different scriptures. Now is it mandatory for us and uh, uh, so let no one judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a feast or a new moon or a Sabbath, you don't have to do that. These are a shadow of things to come. These are the shadow of things to come. That is extremely important. Paul writing to Colossians uh, chapter 2 verse 17, he says, um, these are the shadow of the things to come. I mean, they, they just give us indications of what is going to happen and so on. And we looked at all the different things and the first the first the very first feast was Passover, and uh, it comes from Leviticus uh, chapter 23, verse 5, and the, and, the, and the actual prescription and the rest of the explanation and how it started and what it commemorates and everything comes from Exodus chapter 12, if you read. And uh, at the end of Exodus chapter 12, I mean, Exodus chapter 12 tells us and how, how they have to celebrate the Passover, the festival of Passover. Um, you know, the first very Passover and they had to kill that lamb and then put the blood on the doorpost and uh, the angel of death will pass over. They will not visit that particular. The firstborn will live and all that. And uh, if you read to the end, 12, 26 to the verse 26, when your children ask you, when your children ask you, Dad, what is this you're doing? This Passover thing that you're doing every time, every new moon. Um, on the 14th day of this particular month, what is, what is this? Tell them how God spared your home and how you are able to live today. You are the eldest in the family. If you are still alive, it is because of Passover. God clearly told them to remember these things, what God has done uh, for them. And Jesus himself has the last supper with his disciples, if you read Matthew's gospel and so on. And uh, that is about uh, the historic relevance to people of Israel. But we have some relevance as well, uh, the messianic relevance. And Jesus himself is our Passover. And uh, Jesus, at the particular day, stood before Pilate on Passover day. And uh, Paul later on explains and Christ is our Passover and so on. And that is a huge implication for you and for me, a personal relevance. Uh, when we know that Christ is our Passover lamb, and trusting in him gives, gives us the redemption 
and, and so on. That is about Passover. And then we moved on to the next one, unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, interestingly, uh, is not celebrated on one day. It is anywhere between two to six days. And this is explained in Leviticus 23 and so on. And um, it is it is a leaving from um, uh, that life or that that old um, Egypt uh, and so on for them the Israelites and then it also points to Jesus and the sinless life that he lived and uh, uh, and uh, it also symbolizes his burial and so on and then for us uh, it tells us about how we uh, walk carefully uh, a holy life because God is holy and he wants us to be holy and then walk uh, without sin. That is extremely important. And, and this duration is something uh, very um, um, relevant to all of us. And then comes the first fruits. And this is the time Jesus um, uh, um, uh, was raised from the dead. And uh, we, so they celebrate, as they celebrate the first fruit uh, of that harvest season, um, uh, they celebrate the crossing of the Red Sea. And then uh, it also talks about the first fruits and the tithes that they need to bring. And this is to do with Israelites. But when it comes to messianic relevance and uh, um, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he is alive, that is a serious matter for all of us. And those of us who put our trust in him are also called the first fruits, particularly it symbolizes baptism uh, and so on, which we looked at last time. And then comes the Pentecost. And Pentecost is the time that the law was given to them in uh, Mount Sinai. And uh, for us, Pentecost is Holy Spirit writing the laws on our heart. Uh, it's a completely different thing. And uh, um, uh, Messianic relevance, that is the time that Holy Spirit was given to the church, if you read Acts chapter 1 and 2. And uh, here is an important uh, principle for you and for me. And without the Holy Spirit of God within us, uh, you can do, you can't do anything uh, apart from me. That, that's what it is. And we will do everything in, in our Christian walk with the help of the Lord. He helps us to um, uh, lead us and live a victorious life. Uh, the moment you keep your eyes away from the Lord, you, you drown. And Peter's story of trying to walk on the water is a classic example in this, and you need to depend on him. You keep your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith and so on. We have all these different scriptures. Um, that that um, Pentecost uh, helps us to understand some of those things. And then comes uh, the next lot, which is uh, trumpets, uh, the sound of trumpet. And uh, until this point, uh, people do not have too much of... Um, 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 differences, but when it comes to the future, uh, people have a lot of differences and then different views and, 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 and the rest of it. Uh, but we look at uh, normally the trumpets. The trumpet is Jewish New Year and celebration of the creation of the new world and, and all that. And uh, interestingly, it is it's a trumpet call and uh, it's the time of gleaning uh, the last fruit of barley, uh, last grain of barley, whatever is left. Um, and it is also told that you leave the corners so that the strangers and the foreigners might come and glean and then have their way. You don't go and then collect that last thing. Let them eat. Let the strangers eat. Let the foreigner eat and let them be sustained. But Israelites didn't listen to that. They didn't listen to that. They went and then grabbed every small grain out of that and so on. If you, if you go back and then read why why uh, the exile of 70 years of exile um, tells us all about their disobedience and the rest of it. We will not go there, but uh, Trumpets is a serious festival. And uh, as far as the Messianic relevance is concerned, um, so we call it uh, rapture um, or being caught midair uh, or church being taken away or Jesus coming midair or calling them from heaven, calling all of us from heaven, and then we go and then join him and, and that, that kind of stuff. And uh, if you read Revelation uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, a voice I, 
I, uh, um, uh, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet and says, come up here, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Um, so um, the kind of uh, understanding that we have about what it means to us in a Christian life today in Auckland here uh, in this particular day is uh, watchful warfare that we are in and uh, living in view of imminent return and be alert be sober-minded and all the rest of it. It, it. Trumpet gives us a warning. Trumpet gives us a warning and you need to be alert the kind of, the kind of, as, as, far as, as far as we are concerned. But we have clear scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of how these events are going to happen as far as prophetic uh, matters of future are concerned. Uh, we have a clarity in these little scriptures. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we are who, we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first after that. We who are still alive, our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Very clear. And the first Corinthians, Paul writing, it's a mystery. We will not, we will not all asleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will raise, will be raised imperishable and we will be changed and all this um, different, different uh, scriptures that we have uh, about this fact. Then comes atonement, and for them, for the Israelites, uh, it's the holiest day of national forgiveness and so on, and uh, this is the day of atonement, and uh, we, prophetically for us, we know that it is the time of the second coming of Christ in power as prophecy and so on, and I've given you so many verses here. And I will bring such distress upon people. I'm reading from Zephaniah uh, chapter 1, verse 17. And I will bring such distress on people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entiles like dung, uh, says, uh, prophesies uh, Zephaniah. And then Matthew, Jesus himself talking, talks about the distress of those days and uh, and uh, uh, Paul writing to Romans tells us that all Israel at that time will be saved and that is their time and uh, <clears throat> and the revelation chapter 19 tells us the heavenly warrior defeats the beast uh, which is in power at that time and for us as far as us today uh, what is the relevance of all these things and uh, you know as we go to church we we, we break the bread and then have uh, the drink together. And at that time, we are told to examine yourself. Examine yourself. First Corinthians chapter 11, 27 to 31, if you read. Uh, the one reason that we go to church is not only worship him, but also uh, judge yourself so that you won't be judged. And I want you to read that portion very clearly. Judge yourself so that you won't be judged. The moment you judge us, that is what uh, the other church that I spoke to you about uh, <clears throat> strongly believes. They talk about repentance. I'm talking about um, um, LCF, Layman's Christian Fellowship, that we used to go when we were in, we were in college, in, in the university. And their point of view is you have to repent every day. Repent, repent, repent. And you have to go to the pastor and repent and tell them what you have done in the last week. There are a lot of repentance involved in that church. Uh, but it's biblical as well. I mean, you don't have to highlight it so much and make a denomination out of it. But the Bible tells us very clearly, you examine yourself at the Lord's table and so that you will not be judged. Uh, it's important that we know to discern, judge, and all that, all kinds of so that's important for us as we as we go on then um, day of atonement for us is Sunday. And then we have the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, which is in Leviticus chapter 23, 33 to 44. And I want you to uh, read this verse 40. I have given you the um, reference from 32 to 
44, but if you read verse 40, and you shall take for yourself on the first day the fruit of the beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And I'm particularly interested in the palm trees and the way that we celebrate Palm Sunday. <laughs> Um, and and this is coming from Leviticus and all these different symbols is really uh, interesting. And uh, um, this is the celebration of uh, the people of Israel coming into the promised land. And of course, uh, the, the um, um, historical significance of messianic significance is a 1000 year messianic kingdom on earth. And then uh, for us, it is... <coughs> Um, having that rest in Christ, in Christ alone we sang just now. Um, and we, we enjoy our life, a Christian life in, 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 in the Lord. Um, that is pretty much uh, the, the um, um, thing that we looked at last time and just to want to recap. And we also plotted these things to different events uh, in the Messianic um, uh, prophecy, prophetically, how uh, these things can be mapped together. <clears throat> how the uh, Holy Spirit of God was given to the church uh, as they were waiting in the upper room in Acts 1 and 2 and so on. And uh, how these different things have bearings on different things. For example, here, um, uh, on, uh, when, when uh, the law was given to them, um, 3,000 people were slaughtered on the day, but the Holy Spirit of God was given to them. 3,000 people were saved on that particular day. And we see those uh, interesting parallels between uh, what uh, they had, Israel, and what has happened in the churches and, and the rest of it. Um, so um, if you actually look at uh, the rest of it, and I told you these are the festivals of the springtime, and these are the festivals of the autumn, and then autumn feasts, these feasts are the shadows of the spring feasts. And these have to happen. These have to come through. And we are waiting for these uh, different things. Now, if you go back and then look at these things, and we have um, clear scripture about the rapture. And we will come back and then talk about rapture a little bit more. And then the Israel here and the Israel here. And uh, Israel not here in this, in this period uh, and that kind of thing that we will be looking at. And before that, we will first of all look at uh, uh, millennium, millennium and uh, our understanding of the millennium or what uh, the Bible teaches us about uh, the millennium. Can we all turn to, please, uh, Revelations chapter 20, if you've got Bibles uh, with you. And I want to read uh, Revelation 20 for all of us. Um, briefly. Revelation 20, uh, chapter 20. Uh, please follow me as I read or listen to me if you, if you have no Bible at reach or if you have your mobile phone, uh, just uh, um, follow. Uh, I just want to read out. That's it. We don't have to... Um, do anything else just to read out and then see uh, Revelation 20 it, it reads like this and then I saw an angel descending from heaven holding the key of the abyss um, the interpretation here is the bottomless pit so I saw an angel descending from heaven holding the keys of the abyss the bottomless pit and a great chain was in his hand the hand of the angel and he overpowered and laid hold of the dragon, which is devil, that old serpent of primeval times, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him securely for a thousand years. Uh, in my version, within brackets, it says a millennium. Thousand years, a millennium. And an angel hurled him into the abyss and closed it and sealed it above him, preventing his escape or rescue so that he would no longer deceive and seduce the nations until 
the thousand years war at an end. After these things, he must be liberated for a short time. And then I saw thrones and sitting on them were those to whom judgment, that is the authority uh, to act as judges was given. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, all the martyrs they're talking about. And because of the word of God, they were all martyred. And those who had refused to worship the beast or his image and had not accepted his mark on their forehead and on their hand, on their forehead, on, they did not accept this kind of mark on their forehead or on their hand. Um, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, the non-believers, um, did not come to life again until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. And blessed, happy, prosperous to be admired. Blessed means. And holy is the person who takes part in the first resurrection. Um, over these, the second death, which is the eternal separation from God, the lake of fire, has no power or authority, but they will be priests of God in the Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. Um, that's Revelation 20. And it talks about this particular period, which we call millennium. I want you to read and then just... Uh, Put your thought into it. It's as simple as that. Um, it, it makes it so very, very clear. Um, so that is about uh, the millennium. Uh, the word of God very clearly gives, and especially if you read 20, 21, 22, and starting from 19, um, it gives the whole context. Imagine that there are no chapters and chapter divisions and verse divisions. Take it as a story. Um, gives you. There may be a little bit of difficulties here and there, uh, you might ask questions, of, oh, what is this and when? But this is what it is in general. It is a very clear description of the millennium. Now, uh, the second big question is about rapture. Uh, so what happens and is it does it happen or when does it happen? And uh, we have different interpretations of rapture could happen here or uh, at this point in time, uh, that is before tribulation, or at this point in time or mid-tribulation, or at this point in time, after tribulation, or that is to do with the second coming and so on. Uh, there are different interpretations of Bible or um, uh, the scripture by different people and so on. Um, I, I just depend on uh, uh, simply some of the pictures that the Lord tells us. Um, and uh, if you just go back into Genesis and then read, um, we have an interesting person called Enoch. And if you read Genesis 5, it talks about Enoch. And then later on in different portions of the Bible, especially in Hebrews 11, in the faith heroes, Enoch's name is mentioned. And you will see that he lived in 365 years. He lived. All the days of Enoch were 365 days. Does it ring a bell? 365 days? <laughs> uh, it's as many days as in the, um, a year. For you and for me, 365 days. And Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. And he was the first um, picture of the rapture that we have in the Bible. Now, if you take up Adam, Adam lived 930 years. Um, this all coming from uh, Genesis chapter 5, you open your Bible and then read it. And then Adam lived at a particular point in time and Enoch was born. Enoch was a great, 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 great grandson of Adam. And you have people between. And Enoch was born. And uh, Enoch, interestingly, had a son called Methuselah. Uh, not a Methu that we know. Uh, this is Methuselah from the Bible. And uh, he lived the longest, 969 years. He lived the longest 969 uh, years. Uh, interestingly, the meaning of Methuselah is when he dies, comes the end or the judgment. And when Methuselah died, his great-grandson, Noah, prepared the boat already. And uh, 
when Methuselah died, came the flood, the judgment of the Lord. And during this period of judgment, the tribulation, you may call it, Christ or, or God saved the people of Israel within the boat during that time of flood and the tribulation as the Christ uh, or the Lord's judgment, the wrath was poured upon the earth. And as he was judging the whole of that generation, um, uh, God kept Noah um, in the boat and then saved those people, his own people, his own elect are saved. And uh, this is what we understand. Uh, similarly, the church will be taken away like Enoch was taken away before he sees this because he's one of those people who walked with him and he was not because, because God took him. And uh, when he disappeared, it was, he was 365 years. And if you read, not much mentioned in the Bible, uh, but we know that he had sons and daughters like you and me. He has a family. He has all the burdens. He has all the normal life and so on. Then the other person that was taken away uh, was Elijah, as you know. And Elijah confronted Ahab, and uh, not much detail is given about this uh, man. Um, uh, he's a Tishbite. And uh, there is a lot of interpretation about understanding whether well, he's Elijah a Gentile or a Jew. No, not much uh, inter um, details is given about uh, this man, Tishbite. Um, but he stood for the Lord and, and uh, he's one of those he was taken. And Enoch, before the nation of Israel was born, he's again a, a non-Jewish person. Um, um, he was taken into heaven. And these are the symbols that we have. These are the pictures that, we, the, the, that the Bible gives us very, very clearly um, and so on. And uh, Matthew's gospel, Jesus talking to uh, his disciples in chapter 24, leaves us this end, as in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, as in the days of Noah. And he gives a very picture of, very clear picture of what happened at that time. They were giving in into marriage and doing all sorts of things. They were going in their own way. And even if you go back and then read Genesis chapter 5, the times and of Noah, you will understand um, where we are at at this moment and so on. These are some of the pictures that I, I see um, in the Word of God about uh, uh, these things. So if you come back and then look at uh, this, um, we, we, we looked at these portions about millennium and uh, the rapture, the rapture and uh, the, 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 his, his own church, his own bride will be taken away and along with with the bride will be the Holy Spirit of God and the one who is keeping the world from um, actual evil, actually the one who convicts you and me on an everyday basis. If there is any goodness in the world, it is because of the Holy Spirit of God who stops, who contains um, the evil in the world at the moment. But when the war is coming, the ambassador needs to be lifted up. The moment you have a war with Pakistan, the first thing that happens is the ambassador is recalled home. The, the, the foreign mission, the commission will be called home and they will lift away any kind of bilateral relationship with the countries. And, 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 and then comes the war and then comes the judgment. Um, it is pretty obvious. Um, These are some of the things that we understand from the word of God. And uh, we have other um, uh, things as well. Uh, why um, they didn't see some of these things uh, from prophetic telescoping, they call it. And if you actually look at a picture like this, and you will see three mountains, uh, one after the other. And between the mountains is uh, the, the, the um, uh, valleys, the valleys different times. Uh, but if you look at this way, um, uh, all the three, one after the other, you will see the valleys like you have seen these pictures. But if you are looking at the telescope about these three from this point of view, and you probably will not see this one at all. This is hidden by this peak. And probably these two will look like something like this if you are watching 
looking at a prophetic vision or a distance of uh, um, a distant view, uh, you will only probably see two. That is what they did not see the church age. They did not see when they were prophesying, particularly Daniel and others. They saw uh, kingdom coming at once, kingdom coming at once, kingdom coming at once. But as progressively relieved, re, um, uh, revealed, and uh, and uh, um, Bible tells us those days when they didn't have knowledge that God didn't uh, really take care of things. But now you know everything, and God has revealed you all these different things, and you are more accountable, as the Scripture uh, tells us. There's a different ways of uh, looking at uh, these things, and um, there are other other. Um, uh, pointers that we have as well. And uh, you know that um, um, particularly Second Peter 3, last time in our Bible study, someone raised this question, what about this 1,000 years like one day in the Lord's sight and so on, quoting Peter. Um, Second Peter 3 verse 8, but beloved, be not, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as thousand years, as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And he's actually talking about the last last days. If you read Second Peter chapter three, it is about the whole of the last days. And he was trying to explain how the days will be and so on. And uh, if you read all these different things, if if you read uh, um, 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 Jesus Matthew's Jesus rendition of last days, Matthew's Gospel chapter twenty four or what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and what Peter is saying in, in this chapter, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, or what John is saying in 1 John chapter 2, um, it's remarkably about, about the same thing. It's, they're all talking about one thing. Let me go back to that uh, picture that I have shown you. Um, as, as the last days come, things get deteriorated. Things won't improve and become better. Um, they get deteriorated and bad. People become bad to worse, as we are noticing. That's very clear about the last days. And all the prophecies tell us very clearly, uh, the last days are going to be very bad days. And, and actually, um, the, the evil is not coming from outside. We are not too worried about white side, uh, outside evil. Many times we look at gays and and lesbians and all the different things that has happened to know, which is very true. But what is uh, remarkably important for us to understand is the apostasy within the church. The apostasy within the church, that is dangerous. That is very dangerous. That is what prophecy tells us and bad things are going to happen. And uh, Paul writing to uh, Timothy tells us in the last days, scoffers will come. And people are selfish, money-minded, and boasting, and all the things. You read Second Second Timothy chapter three, and you will understand what is. They are writing to the churches. Actually, this is about churches that we are talking about. This is about the body of the Lord inside apostasy that we are talking about, the evil that is coming in uh, into the church, into the church, and what we are accepting within the church, and and, and the license. And in the name of grace, in the name of God that we were talking about um, and, and, and tolerating, uh, that is more dangerous. Uh, that is important point that I would like to make. This is There is a deterioration uh, in the way of morals. Um, at my own, as I was growing up, there are certain things people used to uh, look at very bad. But nowadays, people are accepting if you, if you are drug addict and if you are having too many relationships and so on like your Hollywood people and so on they're looking at as great people great models and there's a lot of lot of uh, compromise in our moral ethic basic models I'm talking about leave alone the Christian ethics and, and, and the rest of it um, even in the moral values of normal human beings there's a lot of deterioration there's a lot of acceptance of how you can live and uh, what kind of life is acceptable and so on. Um, so there is no improvement. There is a deterioration. And you notice and I notice it in the Bible prophecies uh, very, very clearly. And there are other things that I just want to point out in passing. I mean, I don't want to put a lot of time here, uh, but uh, 
uh, different different ages that you will see. There are seven uh, different ages. If you read Genesis two and three, that's the age of innocence, when Adam and Eve were having good relationship with God, and every evening God was coming down into in, in the cool of the day, in the cool of the evening, and He was coming and having a chat, and they were going for a stroll. Um, looking at the trees and probably talking about having a nice conversation uh, uh, with God and that the age of innocence, um, that's the first stage. And as you read Genesis uh, two and three, uh, but the end of this age, I want you to notice uh, man rebelled against God here. And then the judgment Adam has to be, had, had to be cast out. He had to throw him away from that garden and then put a cherubim uh, for him not to get back in and so on. And uh, the judgment. And the second is about water. Um, uh, um, sorry. Uh, Genesis 4 and 8, if you, if you read, uh, it's the age of conscience. I mean, uh, after innocence, God put a conscience in your, in, your, in your heart. And you know what is right and what is wrong. And people were not following uh, the basic thing. And God was really, really angry. For the first time we read in the uh, scripture, God regretted for having to make man. That is a staggering statement. God regretted for having to make a man, um, create a man. And man has gone so bad, so bad, so bad. And if you, if you look at some of the reprobations uh, that uh, Genesis tells us about the uh, people of Noah's time, um, we see some parallels now at the end of the age again. And that seems to happen again and again. There is a rebellion straight away against God and God's principles and God's commandments, God's uh, way of um, asking, I mean, God's um, way of living that he prescribed to us. And there is a blatant refusal, blatant rejection, blatant uh, rebellion. And God gets really, really angry here. And then again comes the wrath for that particular um, dispensation, if you call it uh, that way, but that period of time, uh, Noah's flood comes. Again, this chapter closes with a judgment. And then comes Genesis chapter 9 and 11. And the nations are formed from Seth and from Noah after he came out of the, of the boat of that ark. Uh, his own children went into different parts. The nations were formed and so on. And Babel Again, people went against the Lord and they wanted to reach heavens by building a tower. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, um, that kind of stuff. I mean, again, uh, God had to judge them. And that is another period of time. And then the period of promise from Genesis 12 to 50. And God brought out a nation starting from Abraham and, and so on. Uh, but uh, they were not okay, and uh, God had to enslave them in Egypt. Um, and then comes uh, the age of law, starting from Exodus 1 uh, to Acts chapter 1, um, or maybe a little more than that, when uh, AD 70, um, the temple was flattened. The temple... Um, um, in Jerusalem was flattened and all Israel had to scatter uh, and so on. That is the judgment given. And then comes the church, age of church, age of church. And we see the rebellion again and, uh, and uh, God is going to be angry. And then he is to pour tribulation and so on. And then comes um, the age of kingdom. And even after seeing, even after seeing God's rule, uh, there is a rebellion because uh, uh, Satan is going to be loosed one more time and he's going to go and then deceive the nations as we read um, chapter 20 of Revelation just now. For a thousand years he was going to be bound and at the end of the thousand years he's just going to release for him for a little while and he was going to go and then deceive the people. The same people having seen the Lord on the throne in his reign, uh, they were going to go against him and at that time the nations will be judged one more time. And um, then you have the new heaven and new earth. And so a lot of purging is happening. A lot of purging is happening. A lot of cleansing is happening. And, uh, and finally, as we see, uh, man's heart is continuously wicked. Man's heart is continuously wicked. 
and the, 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 the one thing that you notice is we rebel against God. We don't want to be uh, accountable. We rebel against God's commands, what God tells us and so on. Um, so these are the different uh, scene that we see. And also there is a lot of mapping. I don't know whether I have time to go into all these different things. God created uh, the world um, in seven days. If each day is 1,000 years, and um, uh, if, if this is where the AD can be divided from BC, AD and BC at the, at the coming of Christ, and just put cross just to differentiate the time frame between these two, um, if you differentiate, and this is uh, 1000 BC, which is number four, and this is 2000 BC and 3000 BC and 4000 BC. And if you actually go and then read the genealogies very carefully and account the time, particularly coming uh, from Leviticus um, and Chronicles, Chronicles, uh, you have all the uh, genealogies and the genealogies in Genesis chapter five, for example, if you count all the time, it's actually 4,000 years from Jesus uh, till Adam. And then you have uh, 2,000 years this way in the year of the Lord, Anno Domini, and you have before Christ, and you have uh, first century, second century, and the third century, and so on. That's how we go. And then if you actually look at the creation account, uh, Scholars tell us God has given us the plan, even the very first chapter of Genesis, first two chapters of Genesis, he gave out the plan of what is going to happen. I don't want to go into detail of all those things, and, and only I want to say, will you get into the rest in the seventh week or seventh, seventh 1,000 words, uh, sorry, years, 1,000 years, uh, which is the millennium we call about, that is the time God gave rest or God took rest and so on. And if you look at number six, uh, 666 or whatever six that is, uh, you see man was created at the time, sixth day man was created and the beast was created at the time pointing to um, that, that man beast that was going to come at the last time, uh, last uh, period. But before that, Jesus gives us the life. He is the life and so on. He's the light. And he is the son of the righteousness. And uh, you, you, you have different symbols for all these things. And then you have the promised land here. And particularly at this time, Abraham, about 1,800 years BC, uh, you have Abraham. And then you have Moses, um, um, who takes Israelites um, on dry land out of the sea. And this land and sea and seed and fruit are created in day three. Light and sun and moon and stars created in day four. All these different symbols uh, we have pointing to uh, the history of the world in a, in a finer detail. Uh, if you dig deep into all the, all the things. And uh, particularly interesting is how the whole um, Bible is divided in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, Innocence and 4 to 8, Content 9 to 11, Government 12 to 50, Promise and Acts 1 to Acts, sorry, Exodus 1 to Acts, Acts 1, we see the, the time of law, and then 2 to Revelation 3, you see the time of church, and then you see the millennium from 20. And 21, 22, Revelation 20, 21, 22, you see new heaven and new earth and so on. And uh, we have other discussions as to uh, what judgment is going to happen and what judgment is going to happen and, and stuff like that. And uh, we, we, we are taken out of the time frame of this world. And then we are talking about different things and then plot, trying to plot these things. But what I want to tell you is about this, about when it comes to the judgment, two things are extremely important. Well, one of my friends, when we were talking about the Bhima judgment and the white throne judgment and all that, we were talking about one of my friends who is a bit witty, but he's profound in some of his questions. And he asked this question uh, to, to an uncle who was explaining all these things to us. Um, he asked my uncle, when I'm standing in front of the judgment, where will my wife be? He asked. Will she come to know all that I have done? <laughs> Um, because that uncle was telling us on the day of judgment, all your life will be displayed like you see on a projector, you know, screen, you know, everything that you have done is crystal clear for everyone and so on. And immediately he asked uncle, 
will my wife be there and will she come to know all that i have done um and we all laughed and then uncle interestingly said uh, very interestingly she will be there but she is busy accounting for her, her own <laughs> uh so that much we know about uh, some of these things we are all accountable that's the only thing that you and i have to know for every act for every penny that you spend for every decision that you take for every choice that you make you and i are accountable accountability is built into the family if you understand my children are accountable to me and i am accountable to my children about every penny that i spend and every decision i take and everything that i do where i went and where i come immediately the call comes dad where are you there is an accountability built within the family and there is an accountable accountability built in god's family and some of us wanting to rebel against this accountability um always there and it's always there within the families and and we always take it take these things very seriously oh that that family is broken because they are not willing to be accountable to each other wife and husband are not willing to be accountable to each other uh they they thought i want to spend my own money my way and i i i will come home whenever i want to and i will have my own relationship with them so there is no accountability which brings in a lot of pain and all that kind of stuff but god builds this accountability uh in every system and and in in every relationship and in god's relationship to human being there is that accountability and you and i will be judged when will we be judged and how will we be judged is a different matter as far as you and i are concerned we will all be standing in front of his throne and not only you and me every person every person ever lived in this world will stand in the judgment that that that's that's what we need to know and one point that i want to highlight here is every account of the last days if you talk about peter's if you talk about paul if you talk about jesus if, if you talk about john every account of the last days the description of the last days after telling all the different things finally comes the warning you be careful you be alert you take care of your own life that is the alas that is coming why god gives all this information is not for us to know and there will be lots of gaps as i said if you look at this uh diagram one more time when we are looking at the prophetic future every detail is not given as you like to have you like to understand there will be gaps of course there will be gaps because um is a num- number of things you will never be able to understand even if they are given to you we will never be able to make sense there will be little bit of haziness and we may be seeing two peaks at one and we may miss some valleys and we may miss some uh details and so on but what i understand personally for me is i need to be careful and i need to work out my salvation with fear and trembling and uh, for, for, for more than anything else am i in his hands am i his person is the first choice that you need to uh make uh, anyway that's about the judgment that i want to make those comments and i i talked about all these dispensations and so on and uh, coming to uh, one more thing here and uh, you see um in matthew's gospel 24 uh the similar account mark also writes in mark chapter 13 and luke also mentions uh, the same account in uh luke 21 and so on um they uh, they call it all of it uh discourse they, they call it all of it discourse um it's a fancy name for simple conversation that the that jesus and uh, jesus and uh, disciples had sitting on the mount of olives the same place jesus is going to come back um as we see at uh, the prophecy in zacharias anyway uh they were in the temple and uh, that is the time they see a widow putting some coins in the treasury and jesus comments on that widow's uh, generosity uh that event happens that day within the temple and they go into the temple they do i don't know what the ritual that they needed to do worship the lord and so on pray and jesus and his disciples come out of the temple cross the um walls of jerusalem go down the valley and come up onto the olive uh, mount of olives and they are just having a good time 
on Mount of Olives. And Mount of Olives, they say, overlooks the city of Jerusalem just like that. And if you are seated on the Mount of Olives, you see the um, um, Jerusalem. And uh, someone commented, one of the disciples commented, Lord, look at the magnificent structures that you see, beautiful building in front of you. And Herodic temple, the temple that uh, Herod uh, um, built seemed to be one of the magnificent structures in the ancient world, one of the one of the uh, wonders, great wonders. Um, beautiful, beautiful building. And, and if you see the measurements of each of the stone, marvelous, marvelous. And someone just commented on the structures and the building just in front of them as they're looking at their view. They're enjoying the view, actually. Then Jesus tells them, but what is going to happen to this city is really, really uh, bad. Not one stone on top of, top of another stone is going to remain and this is going to be overthrown. And then gives a beautiful prophecy uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, if you, if you read. And Bible gives you this. And the last point, and I want you to remember this point very, very carefully. Because some of the things that we haven't seen, it is very difficult for mind to imagine. That's why God leaves little bit of glimpses here and there just to tell us what's going to happen. That's what we see even in the uh, feasts that we looked at. Even the feasts that we looked at, as I told you, autumn feasts are the shadows or um, depend on spring for the interpretation, you know, uh, to be able to understand uh, the um, uh, feasts of autumn. Uh, or the feasts of the spring, so the four shadows of uh, the feast of the atom. I mean, in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is this. God gives us glimpses of what was going to happen in future, in present, and in the past, so that we have a clarity in terms of this. And in AD 70, if you look at this picture on my screen, uh, this temple was destroyed uh, to literally to every word that Jesus told what was going to happen. And he tells them very clearly, don't run into the city when that attack is going to come, you flee into the mountains. If you read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. And all the Jews, the basic reasoning at that time is get into the fortified city. When an enemy attack comes, what they would do is run into the city rather than go out of uh, the uh, outer walls of the city. They come inside, they close the doors, uh, gates, sorry, the, they close the gates and they start the warfare and they have different um, um, boundaries, different walls, uh, layer one, layer two, and so on, difference of depth, as we, as we know, the strategy of the ancient world. Um, the, the, the basic tendency, the basic intuition is run into the city when the enemy attack comes. But what Jesus tells is interesting. You don't go into the city, that is dangerous. You run to the mountains, and then Samarians do. Christians did that during AD 70, if you actually read extra biblical account, and particularly Josephus' uh, historical accounts, you know that many people who fleed actually into the mountains survived. But those in Jerusalem were slaughtered, and at that time, 1.1 million people slaughtered uh, in that siege of Romans at that time. And uh, there's the biggest Holocaust at that time and people were just slaughtered and Joseph was gives us that number. Um, and the same thing is going to happen here again in Jacob's uh, trouble in this tribulation time. And uh, there's a parallel here. And there's another parallel uh, at the time of Daniel, if you like. Um, um, Daniel comes in here uh, in his prophecy sometime here. And then he prophesies about 490 years of time. He prophesies about 490 years of uh, time. And 483 happened until Jesus gets on top of a donkey and then rides into the city of Jerusalem. 483 years happened. And then Jesus was slaughtered here and rejected by Jews. And then the prophetic week of prophecy stops here. 
And as Israelites were about to get into the promised land, and uh, the spies went into the city and then came with two different accounts. Caleb and Joshua told them, no, the Lord is behind us. We can go and conquer those people. But all other spies told them, no, if we go inside, we are going to be killed. There are giants there. They are well-equipped and we will not win and so on. Depending on the uh, report of these rest of the spies, 10 of those, they went back rather than getting into the promised land. As a result, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, if you remember. Now, when Jesus was rejected here on the cross, when he rode into Jerusalem on a colt of a donkey, and they slaughtered him on, and, G uh, and God said, no, you cannot get into this. Now, this is the time of others. Others have to come into this. And it was a halt. You know how long? Exactly. And after that, he establishes something called Jubilee. Jubilee is a 50-year uh, time frame. And you will see, here you will see 40 years of wilderness wandering. And here you will see 40 Jubilees wandering into the nations of the world. When they got scattered at AD 70, when their city was destroyed and the Jews scattered all over the nations, those remnant of them. And uh, in 1948, they got their country back in one day. It's a miracle country. And you look at the Jewish history. It's amazing, mind-boggling. In 1948, exactly 2,000 years, that is 40 jubilees, 40 fifties, 2,000 years in 1948, they, they get their um, land back. In one day, the nation is formed. In the history of the world, it never happened in 1948. And uh, the Jewish history, exactly after this time. And after that 70 years of time, and uh, this guy called Trump comes, and then they are able to have their Jerusalem back as they are um, in 2018. Uh, particularly May 14th, these two events happen. Very interesting if you go back and look at the history um, of what happened. Why 70 here? And uh, you know, 70 years of exile there and so on. There are so many parallels that, that, if, you, that if you look at um, and comes the tribulation. And there is a, there is a huge evidence towards uh, this event of rapture. But the only thing that you and I need to, uh, 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 but one point before I close. Uh, here, in the prophecy of Daniel, uh, at the end of this 483, um, can't remember exact number of the week there, there is a guy called uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, if you, if you remember the history. And this guy actually, um, you, you, you know that word, um, uh, abomination of desolation uh, and actually uh, sacrilege actually he takes a pig into the holiest of the holies and then slaughters it there sacrifices or, or or kills it there as a kind of abomination for the Lord and the similar thing is going to happen here uh, when the beast comes and then sits uh, on the throne and then tells the Jewish people to worship him and so there are quite a lot of parallels if you read Daniel uh, and then try and understand. And uh, as I said, 483 years of prophecy is completed. And when the rapture happens, another seven years is going to unfold. And this is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is nothing but Israel. Israel. But even at that time, the Lord is going to save them as he saved Noah and his elect, his own people in the ark at Noah's time. Uh, God is going to save his own people and his own people will finally realize who the Messiah was and then they will be saved. This is the time given to Israel. And if you have any doubt, I want you to read Romans chapter 11 and uh, Paul's rendition is very, very clear. I just want to read one or two verses there and then we will close. If you go to Romans chapter 11.
I'm reading a few verses. If you have the Bible, please open and then look at the uh, Paul's argument here. Uh, I don't read the whole chapter, but I want you to read and understand uh, some of these verses that I'm giving to you um, uh, before you make a decision about uh, what is important for all of us um, as far as this prophecy is concerned. Um, Israel is not cast away is the heading in, in the version that I'm reading, chapter 11. I say then, has God rejected and disowned his own people? Certainly not. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his chosen people whom he foreknew or he established or called and established. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars and I alone am, I, am left of the prophets and they are seeking my life. But God is, what is God's response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to the, uh, bowed the knee to Baal. So to then at the present time, there has come to be a remnant, a small believing minority, according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? I'm reading verse 7. Israel failed to obtain what, was, what it was seeking, but the elect obtained it, with the rest of them became hardened and callously indifferent and so on. But what Paul argues here is um, Israel is back in picture. And uh, I want you to read one more verse. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, Jesus himself says this in, um, in Luke chapter 21. The same account. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 24, talk about the same thing, Olivet Discourse, as they were seated on the Mount of Olives and then talking about the future events. Um, um, God says something very interesting, very interesting. Um, which verse? Which verse? Which verse? Which verse? Uh, do not panic, my spirit and will not come. Things to come. Um, he talks about... Yeah, um, uh, 24, please. Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 24, tells us, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations, talking about Israel, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Um, um, Luke gives that extra information. If you go back to my picture here, this is the times of the Gentiles. And if you actually look at what is happening in Israel, this is the times of the Gentiles and Jerusalem is underfoot in the hands of the Gentiles during this time. Until this happens, um, when this, until such time, these things have to happen and Israel will be back into picture and so on. So many of us interpret that uh, church is the new Israel, but uh, ethnic Israel, I think, is very important as I, as I see uh, the history and the newspaper together, uh, the newspaper and the Bible together, Bible prophecy together. And uh, um, the nation of Israel um, is very much alive and God's plans, and he's going to come back during the time of tribulation. It is there, and that's why it's called Jacob's trouble. And uh, at that time, uh, church will be out of picture. And uh, there will be a few questions um, in the understanding of all these things. But the important thing that you and I need to remember is, are we close to that event, the rapture? That's the most important thing that you need to understand. I think last time or the before last time, someone asked, um, what is this uh, symbol of 666? Um, do we have it on hand or do we have it on the head? Um, I, don't, I don't remember when it was actually, but this question raised during this time. Um, we, all, we already uh, hold a credit card. Um, are we not having, or do we take it literally? What do these people say? Uh, or is it important and so on? Um, I carry the credit card and I, <laughs> I have all the, all the different things and I have an IRD number here in New Zealand. 
which means I have a number. Uh, I carry a number. And my transactions, financial transactions, my salary, how much tax I'm paying and how much you think, everything is tracked. And not only that, I carry some other cards as well. Uh, every time I go to a supermarket and I swipe this card as well so that I get some few discount, discount on some of the things that I buy and the rest of it. But I have been using all these cards and all these different things. And I think I am tracked because of my mobile phone, maybe. Uh, anyone can track my moments. And, uh, and um, um, uh, by now, uh, the data, probably in Google or elsewhere, know that I am, my name is this, and this is my age, and I have a wife and two kids, and they know about my kids, and they know about their day, age, and they, they know very clearly about what my kind of activities, what kind of things I do when I'm online, and the rest of it, my cookies, as you understand, I read all that particular information about every individual, and they have a lot of information about every individual. That is all true. Um, but this is the first time uh, in COVID-19, uh, for the first time, I felt that my freedom was lost for the first time. I had to stand in queue outside of uh, a supermarket with a particular distance that I needed to maintain. And uh, someone regulated my buying. I could not buy more than two uh, of the items, some of those items which are scarce. And I could not buy the second ice cream for my kids. Kids, I, I, I was given only one ice cream. I was regulated. My buying was regulated. My freedom was cut out. And I couldn't go out with my family. Even when I go out, I had to be very careful about not only my own um, safety and, and so on, but also it was the government regulation that I have to cover and I have to wear gloves and I have to sanitize myself and so on. It's all within the context of health and safety and the rest of it. But it gives me a very clear picture of how much someone is in control of my life. Until such time, until now, we are in the hands of good governments and still the Holy Spirit of God is in the picture and things are happening properly. And we enjoy these little credit cards and then extra discounts when we swipe these cards and numbers and so on. But there will be a time that you and I will be tracked and every buying will be tracked and every selling will be tracked and everything will be tracked. And you and I uh, will not be able to buy anything or sell anything and do anything and so on. Your freedom is cut out. I have seen only in the movies for the first time I experienced uh, these things. That's why those people ask Jesus, I think it's in Luke, uh, uh, Luke's Gospel chapter 13, when a tower of Siloam fell and then 18 people died and then they all run to Jesus and tell, why is this happening? Why are those 18 people died when the tower fell? Are they, is it because they are worse sinners than any of us in the whole of Israel? And then Jesus stops them and then said them, don't worry about their sin, but you be careful. And every one of these signs clearly tell us. Bible tells us very, very clearly. Prophecy is very clear. It's a plain text matter. It's a plain text matter. There's nothing um, hidden there and, and that you and I cannot understand. I told you about one of my friends, and he recently started to read the Bible. Uh, his name is Srinivas. He comes from uh, um, Tirupati, one of the one of the religious cities in, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, where the temple is and so on. And he is a Brahmin and he is into artificial intelligence and neural networks and so on. He has recently finished his PhD in, um, in artificial intelligence and so on. And he starts to read the Bible and then he confesses this thing. He, he called me in the middle of the night and then said, brother, I can understand, uh, understand a Bible. What he imagined was, he thought, Bible or the scripture, or Quran or any of Vedas or anything should be an intelli in unintelligible language. There should be some slokas or some other language and it has to be interpreted and so on. But when he started to read the Bible in the plain text, he called me in the middle of the night and then tells me, I can understand Bible. Bible is a normal English, normal language. Man, Bible is a normal language and you don't have to attach so much, too much of unnecessary things into it and you just plainly read and then understand. that's what I have done. I rejected the Bible for a long time and I went to scholars. My, my, my journey back to Bible is also very interesting. I mean, I'm, for me personally, I don't know whether 
whether whether whether it interests you or not but very interesting to me i rejected bible because i didn't understand part of it particularly coming in telugu um then uh, when i come back to the lord and i started to read bible through the help of someone else our daily bread the word for today and this kind of stuff i used to enter into the bible with the help of others but later on i weaned off and then started to look at the word of god myself and uh, now i interpret scholars based on the word of god that's what variants did when paul came and then taught them about the scriptures they went home and then searched the scriptures to see what they told is re- true or not that's what variant christians did and you and i have to do that there will be scholars out there they interpret the word of god for us and it's extremely important sometimes to understand the different points of view and so on but finally you have to go back into the word of god and then search the scripture yourself to find out what others are saying true or not bible cannot be interpreted scholastically it has to be interpreted spiritually with the help of the holy spirit of god and he gives us uh, the guidance and he has left us enough evidence to understand uh, what's going to happen not to give you the information can i repeat that please god has given you enough detail not to give you all the information the the panoramic picture of what's going to happen but he gives us all that information whatever information he has given us just to make you and me ready you have only one chance before you die or before he comes you got to make that choice and you got to live that life that he wants us to live and he gives us that time long time and as we've seen different pictures and different different patterns in the word of god all of them every discourse and every rendition of the last days descriptions finally gives us warning you be sober you be alert you be careful you be ready otherwise you will be deceived you will be gone you will be in danger that's the reason for the lord giving us these things and i wanted to leave that uh, give that two scriptures as well men um work out your salvation with fear and trembling work out your salvation with fear and trembling and uh, peter tells us uh, the last days you need to be very careful and you need to be so minded you need to be alert and uh, two things for us if you have not accepted the lord as your personal savior which is a definite experience um you need to you need to ask the lord lord i i trust in you i believe in you and uh, i open my mouth and open my heart and then trust in you believe and i want to surrender my life unto you that's the first thing that you need to do and if you've already done and if you're a christian um you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling and every day walk is important and at the end of the day you and i stand in front of him give a an account of our lives account of things that we have done and uh, um the lord gives us that uh, allowance as well if you judge yourself so that you will not be judged in other words you won't repeat that mistake again so that you don't have to um uh, be judged for every one of those things and you will be a little bit more careful that's why we take these things seriously and then break the bread and then have the communion day in and day out i mean um every sunday for us uh, at least and all the symbols and the feasts that i have introduced clearly tell us our walk with the lord i told you there is a um a historical relevance in terms of uh, israelites there is a messianic or prophetic relevance but more importantly there's a personal relevance all those festivals and all these different things that we have studied and looked at and that personal relevance is important for us what is in it for me today and how do i um conduct myself how is my day uh, going to be what kind of decisions and choices that i make that are godly and so on these are the thoughts uh, i want to leave uh, with all of you um tonight uh, brothers and sisters and uh, and uh, and thank you so much uh, for giving me this time